Hello and welcome to From Time to Time, a poem. I'm Deborah Ellis, a teacher and author with Locia Editore and Helpling Languages. And the idea of this series of presentations is to share ideas with you on different poems, sometimes topical, sometimes classic, but revisited, hopefully always beautiful and to offer a starting point on each of them which teachers and students can develop. Uh, don't pretend to be an expert or to know all about them. The presentations are humbly and simply ideas, reflections which I hope will be useful but above all pleasurable. Uh, the first poem in the series is Snowdrops by Nobel Prize 2020 Louise Glick, pronounced Glick according to Wikipedia, uh, although it looks like Gluck, taken from the Pulitzer Prize winning collection, The Wild Iris, Snowdrops. Um, I became intrigued by Glick, not only in terms of what it is about her poetry, which led to her meriting such a high accolade as the Nobel but also by an article which appeared in The Guardian and which the head of English at my school shared with us, the members of the department. It pointed out that Glick is the 16th woman to win the Nobel, the first American woman since Toni Morrison back in 1993, and it said that her poetry is a poetry which is striving for clarity, which is candid and uncompromising, which intrigued me to find out more about the way she writes. The other thing that caught my attention was, uh, and pleased me infinitely, was the fact that she said um, that it was teaching that helped her to be to be creative. She said that she tried to withdraw from society in a sense, to uh, d dedicate herself to writing. But she found that in that uh, almost artificial kind of situation, um, she had a writer's block. And it was when she began teaching, when she went back to what she refers to as an authentic life, and we can all agree there, teaching is pretty authentic, and that it was then that her creativity began to flow again. And so I, I really like the idea um, that um, a teacher can, uh, or teaching can not only inspire students to be creative, but it can also inspire the teacher herself or himself to creativity. I also found an article or a, a citation on a, UNESCO, on a UNESCO site in which Glick said um, that the advantage of poetry over life is that poetry may last. And this idea of the eternal nature of art and the transience of human life is a bit of quite an old story. But notice how Louise in this particular quotation qualifies uh, that idea. The advantage of poetry over life is that poetry, if it is sharp enough, may last. Now, um, I have found out working on this presentation, I've come to understand that Glick is a woman who chooses her words with extreme care. And if she has chosen that particular adjective, sharp, to describe her poetry, poetry, it was with um, a great deal of consideration. So I'm also intrigued to find out how, how she intends to sharpen, to uh, make her poetry sharp, incisive perhaps. Um, within the article, it spoke about this poem, Snowdrops, and uh, cited a few lines. And I became intrigued by this idea of uh, maybe a nature poem. And um, what was it about this delicate and fragile flower, this miraculous flower, which can appear through the snow, which inspired Gluck. And I thought about the name of the flower in English. Um, it focuses, of course, the idea of a snow drop 
it focuses on the flower shape, shaped like a droplet, a droplet perhaps of thawing snow. And I couldn't help thinking about the contrast between the name for this flower in English and its name in Italian, Bucaneve. Um, and I saw that, for example, German and Spanish focus in a similar way to English on the shape of the flower's head. Instead of referring, it, of referring to it as a drop or a droplet, um, they liken it to a bell. The bell which rings to announce the arrival of spring, perhaps. The return to life after winter. Uh, in a similar way, perhaps, to um, Shelley. Mike Glick's poem, Speak of the Promise of Spring, um, just as Shelley reassures us that in the midst of winter, in, in his case, the winter of political and social discontent, spring, that is rebellion, even revolution, is just round the corner. Have faith, things will change. Is that what Glick is going to try to say? Or might she be thinking more along the lines of Bucaneve, um, or the French, Perce Neige, um, beautiful and delicate amid the harshness of winter, but powerful, strong, able to survive, to overcome hardship. And this idea of sharp delicacy a lovely oxymoron, uh, full of ambivalence. So, inspired by the newspaper article, intrigued by the title, it felt like it was time to read the poem for the first time. Reading for the first time, we're establishing initial impressions, seeing which questions the poem encourages us to ask, to, to see if it makes us want to know more. Uh, here it is then. Snowdrops by Louise Glick. Do you know what I was, how I lived? You know what despair is, then winter should have meaning for you. I did not expect to survive, earth suppressing me. I didn't expect to waken again, to feel in damp earth my body able to respond again remembering after so long how to open again in the cold light of earliest spring. Afraid, yes, but among you again, crying, yes, risk joy in the raw wind of the new world. So the first thing that strikes me about the poem is this distinctive voice, present right from line one, a first person persona, addressing, it seems, an imaginary audience. Um, so who or what is this speaker? Who or what is the audience? I'm curious as well about the narrative. It's clearly a narrative about suffering and about survival, about trauma and about rebirth. That comes across immediately. But is it a fully optimistic poem? Is there more to be interpreted into the narrative of the poem? I'm also curious about the choices she has made in terms of form, how she has laid the poem out on the page. Look how she has grouped the lines. Look at the line lengths the use of capitalization. There's very little uh, of traditional going on, on here. It's obviously um, quite free in terms of its verse form. Um, but has she, has she made any particular choices for a reason? And what kind of effects are those choices creating? Punctuation too is not to be underestimated. And then language, um, the choices she was making, the tone of the poem, the register of the poem, and is everything being said? Is there something we need to spend time interpreting? 
And finally, the musicality of the poem. <clears throat> Obviously, looking at the poem and listening to the poem for the first time, you are aware that there is no rhyme. However, it's certainly a poem with flow and with musicality. And apart from the rhythms of natural speech, what is enhancing that sense of music, that sense of musicality? So the poem certainly raises many questions and invites us to look at it in more detail.